We are joined this week with George Hay, CWGC official historian. Hello, George. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. This year, it's the anniversary of the Battle of Peshiba. So, George, you are an expert, I've been told, of the Battle of Peshiba <laughs> for our audience. So, um, a bit of background to start off with. What are we talking about? It's the First World War. It's 1917. This year, as I said, it's the, it's the 105th anniversary of the battle. So let's give give us give us a bit of background to the battle. Where where in the world is Bishiba? Let's start off with that. Yeah, I, there's there's a lot to say here. The, the first thing I think is incredibly significant and worthwhile is saying we should talk about the of battle course. of Bishiba. We should talk about what is, this is part of, which is is the war in the Middle East. That that theatre that is not Europe, is not the Western Front, but is further afield. Um, that draws on manpower from across what was the British Empire, um, tens of thousands of people involved, uh, obviously many casualties, uh, many of whom we look after at, at sites across um, that part of the world. Uh, and for the most part, in terms of British consciousness, at least connected to the war and to some extent, probably the wider Commonwealth, though probably not Bashir, and we'll talk about why in a minute. Um, you know, These are theatres that are never spoken about and very little understood uh, by the wider population. So as a start point, this is good, and we should talk about oh, it more. That's good. That's good. Thank, that's you that. Thank, thank you for saying that. Um, Hopefully our audience enjoys this. Well. Exactly, we will inspire them to go and uh, do some reading. Um, but uh, you know why it's significant, why it is where it is, which, as you sort of point, or I've sort of mentioned there, it's in the Middle East, it's what was southern Palestine, the other side of the Sinai Peninsula. Um, we, we get to that point uh, after a, a, a sort of a roundabout um, lengthy campaign since the beginning of the war. I think it's the 6th of August 1914 that Britain declares war on the Ottoman Empire. Uh, that's where this all comes from. Um, but there are no real um, major engagements um, w- with with the Ottoman Empire prior to... I mean, you, you could say um, early on in 1914, you, you do have operations in Mesopotamia, but for the most part, people will sort of say 1915 is when things are happening. And 1915 is when things are happening in Gallipoli in particular. So this is like, if people know anything about the war against the Ottoman Empire um, and the British Empire during the First World War, it is it's centred good. on Gallipoli. It's because, Gallipoli. That's, yeah. that's, that's a major... That's a, that's a major uh, yeah, so th- this is sort of... People talk about Westerners and Easterners in terms of... Um, Grand strategy during the First World War, this being the soft underbelly of 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 the uh, of the of the the enemy, uh, you you can um, attack the Ottoman Empire. They'll roll over. It'll be an easy an easy war. It'll uh, hopefully then um, have a variety of different outcomes, but it would um, weaken. Uh, the position in Germany on the Western Front allow you to potentially win an easier war. Um, that doesn't happen. Obviously, everyone knows that Gallipoli is an enormous uh, failure. Um, uh, the battle there stagnates. Um, it's clear that nothing's going to be achieved. Um, they're not going to force the Narrows up through to um, what's now Istanbul. Um, and so they abandon that operation. But those people... Uh, or those forces, those Commonwealth forces that are engaged in Gallipoli, uh, the majority of them are withdrawn to Egypt. So um, Egypt is hugely significant strategically for the British because you have to understand uh, that despite the fact that it's fighting this war on the Western Front, and that probably is the epicentre of the war, that is where it's going to be won and lost, um, the Britain is a maritime empire and it, it, it sort of draws its power if you like, especially its manpower uh, from across the globe, in particular um, the Indian subcontinent, Australia, etc., etc. And how do you get there? Uh, Where well, you could go all the way around Africa, but you don't. You come up through the Suez Canal. So Suez Canal is is sort of like essential uh, in terms of British lines of communication uh, with with its empire. And so um, it is garrisoned from the beginning of the war all the way through to the end. Um, and it, it sort of ties up quite a large proportion of um, British Commonwealth forces uh, throughout that period. Um, so that significance um, and its proximity to uh, the Ottoman Empire in the form of 
uh, Palestine to the other side of. Um, at, at the time, was the was Palestine part of the Ottoman? Empire? It is. Yeah, it is. And actually, they they the the Sinai Peninsula itself is sort of almost a no man's land. It's sort of uh, effectively in Ottoman hands. It's not being occupied by the British, so they they build defensive lines along the canal um, and throughout. The early part of the war, there are a number of small raids that that come in um, from um, those forces based uh, in in southern Palestine. Um, not enough really to to cause any issues in terms of the operation of the canal, but it's it is concerning and it is a pressure. and And as long as it exists, um, you have to garrison Egypt with enough strength to deter such an incursion. So, of course. Um, in my roundabout way, sort of talking about this idea of where where um, the Ottoman Empire is being engaged, so uh, initially down Gallipoli, um, at least by the British, I'll say that. Um, it's, uh, there isn't the manpower or the wherewithal, or in terms of the command in, uh, in Egypt at the time, Archibald Murray, um, there isn't this great incentive to, to push out uh, until he's encouraged to do so. And, and that's partly because he has that flood of reinforcements that are coming back from Gallipoli. So um, what Murray is effectively told to do is, okay, now you're going to push out across, regain the Sinai Peninsula, uh, and then attack the Ottomans uh, in um, their own territory and, and, and push them back and away from the canal and hopefully, I guess, deliver some victories for the British. So um, this is taking place preparations through 1916 not a lot is happening but 1917 is the year so people will know 1917 in Europe this is the year of um, Arras, Ferdy, Passchendaele, um, Vimy Ridge like massive important events taking place there none of which apart from Vimy Ridge maybe um, deliver any magnificent breakthroughs or developments and so it's hoped that maybe something could happen um, in in the east in the middle east uh and so that's what is is that's the pressure that's being applied and and to some extent that's the advance um that that takes place but it it stops at gaza so if you look at a map of of the campaign you'll see they stick to the coast uh it's really inhospitable inhospitable terrain it's difficult to operate in there's no water and so you have we're talking is it like summer 1917 because it, it is that roughly? Well, actually, this is that's an interesting point. So, that I, that normally in in some of these this fighting, you you have sort of campaigning periods, if yes, you like. But actually, this this is the spring in is where you see the two massive battles at Gaza, um, both of which fail, which we can come to in a minute. But but they're advancing slowly, and they do that by building a railway line along the coast, as well as a water pipeline. So they're 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 pumping water. Uh, to support their very steady advance across the Sinai because it's a desert. This is hard, <laughs> hard to operate in, in these places. Um, and, you know, if we want to think about the nature and the way in which that war is fought, it couldn't be any different to what you're seeing in Europe. You know, this is... Because it's not, it's not trench warfare. It's, um, it's literally... It, it more, does... More kind of, it sounds almost more modern, kind of almost... It's Second a, World War ish. If that, it, it's a little bit that. Term. It's not quite as mobile. Okay. Um, I and mean, it is sort of like positional... Um, but it's slow, but it is mo it is mobile. There is a form it's of mobile. mobility. Okay. They're, they're moving. Not, I mean, if you, if you imagine the First World War, you imagine the Western Front, you imagine the trench warfare, you imagine you, know, you imagine it, it's years, not of, years of entrenchment and and defensive lines. In, and, in, this, yeah. in this case, we're t we are talking about movement. Move, move, however, however slow, however slow, it's still movement. Yeah, yeah. And 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 you know, the enemy is as much the terrain and the environment as it is the Ottoman Turks, if you like. Um, and as I say, that that works to a point. And then there, you have two fairly substantial frontal assaults in in the spring of 1917, um, overseen by Archibald Murray, to to break through Gaza, which is the sort of main defensive position um, that guards the entrance, if you like, into into southern Palestine. Um, and they both fail, and Murray is sacked for it um, because, well, that's that's kind of the way in which these things go. And there is this desire to see some form of a victory that year and you have a guy called Edmund Allenby brought in uh, he has done quite a lot of service on the Western Front up to this point as a cavalry commander and he comes out um, takes control of 
the Egyptian Expeditionary Force. Um, and they're facing not just Gaza, but a defensive line that runs out to Beersheba. So Beersheba is, uh, people would call that sort of like the the defensive anchor on the flank. So this, this line is running from Gaza sort of on the coast, on the coastal strip, uh, and running out to Beersheba. And instead of conducting another frontal assault um, on Gaza, uh, the idea is that they would outflank Gaza by taking Beersheba, um, which would then make the position at Gaza vulnerable because British Commonwealth yeah, they, forces they, can come round the back point. they'd have to withdraw. Um, and that's basically what you see. So it's not easy, um, but if you know if we compare this to the way in which battles are fought again on the Western Front, um, we're talking about a day here. It's not just the Australians, we should say that. Um, there is an infantry assault that lasts for the majority of the day, um, but it is the sort of the dash of a couple of light horse regiments who spot an opportunity, thanks to aerial reconnaissance and various other things, to basically charge through, jump the trenches at Beersheba, okay. capture the town. That's actually interesting you mentioned. So it's a mixture of kind of, at the time, kind of old-fashioned warfare, because you're talking about cavalry charges. Ah. But at the same time, you're talking about the reconnaissance, air reconnaissance. Yeah. So, so I mean, th- this is this is a, a personal, a personal bugbear of mine. A little, a little bit because <laughs> I think um, the, a lot of made <laughs> a lot, a lot is made of the last great cavalry charge, yeah. isn't it? That's yeah, kind yeah. of like the one, maybe one that people have heard of Bishop before. So what, what's that interesting? Could be the connection, the yeah. scaling connection, which is obviously very important. For yeah, 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 but yeah. Also that. So, last so f- first of all, technically the light horse aren't cavalry. They're not armed with swords mm. at this point. Some of them are, but at this point, the, these two regiments are not. They're carrying bayonets, <laughs> okay. which wouldn't reach their enemy if they needed to, but that, that wasn't the point. Um, but they are effectively what are referred to as mounted infantry, and there's been this lengthy, boring debate in the interwar years between the interwar being the, the Second Boer War and the First World War. And, uh, the Boer and, War and the First World War. Yeah. And it is, uh, you know, how horses should operate or men on horses should operate in battle and on the battlefield um and there are two very entrenched schools of thought uh, one of which is you know the mounted rifleman effectively mounted infantry um is hugely valuable but they must dismount to fight and then obviously the the sort of the old school if you like um proper cavalryman who believes that there is still such um what they, they, they'd say the arm blanche, which is effectively the use of a sword, but also the, the, the shock impact of the use of cavalry on the battlefield still has relevance even in the age of artillery and machine guns. Um, and what's interesting is people always say, well, the Western Front, you don't see any cavalry. You do, that's a lie. Um, but it's rare because the opportunities aren't there. Uh, but in the Middle East, you see it frequently. So not just Beersheba, um, El Muka. I um, can't remember the name of the other two, come on. There are three cavalry charges by British Yeomanry regiments in, in the Middle East, all of which are, to a degree, successful, um, uh, because the ground allows it, basically. I was going to ask, is it is it the difference in terrain? Yeah. I'm thinking Western Front, this nah. image of mud and trenches, yeah. and, and I'm thinking, you know, desert and yeah, wider that. plains. And, and exactly what you've already said about, um, you know, the nature of warfare being very different. So you don't have... Um, these entrenchments and these defensive built out of concrete, completely impenetrable, um, which would simply not allow anything of, of that type to happen. What you have is space. Space lends itself to men who can cover ground quickly, and and that's what cavalry is all about. And what's I think what people won't really think about is tanks exist by this point, but not in the way that you know them. That <laughs> these these are things that will crawl along. Uh, at less than 10 miles an hour nothing can cover ground as quickly as a horse still horse. at this time of course. so <laughs> I'm not <laughs> suggesting that uh, for a minute that um, that they, they made um, uh, a more significant contribution than they did but actually horses do make sense and so the idea that they are at this point in time at least um, uh completely outdated they're they're obsolete obsolete this is the word i'm looking for because i'm thinking yeah because 19 by 1917 we're you know we're talking tanks appearing as you said we're yeah. talking about airplanes you know so so one, one of the the famous examples well, this is a famous example where you, you spot um the the fact that uh 
maybe certain trenches or, or portions of the line uh, are not as strongly defended as they might have been earlier. And if you can, if you can outflank your enemy, if you can burst through that area very quickly and get behind them, you may then force them to retire or surrender or whatever else. And that's basically what's happening. Um, and the only way you could cover the ground that quickly, as I say at this point, is on horseback because um, you know the, the one thing that that maybe uh, can fill the space is, is the armoured car, and there are lots of those operating in the Middle East and elsewhere as well. But they can't cross trenches, mm. so they're they're not as antiquated and and out of place on the battlefield as we think. And what what's interesting about the Middle East theatre of war is there is loads of cavalry there in comparison to anywhere else. So I've mentioned the British Yeomanry regiments, about half of them are dismounted and they're sort of reformed into something called the 74th Division, um, which is as infantrymen. Uh, but another half uh, remain remain mounted. You have the Anzac units, um, so Australian New Zealand mounted regiments who remain on horseback throughout this, this period of the war. Despite Beersheba being a, a mounted charge, most of the time what they are doing is moving very quickly, dismounting, and then fighting on foot, which is also, you know, again, it's the so, horse allows him to do It that. sounds very chaotic, doesn't it, in terms of how, how that actually works. Yeah. You, know, you picture yeah. jumping over trenches, yeah. behind the enemy lines almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then jumping off horses in the middle of battle and hand to hand. Yeah, like, well, well, sometimes that, but, but, but more importantly, you can put yourself in an advantageous position. That might mean then you can fire down upon your enemy, whatever it happens to be. But specifically, so the 31st of October, that's when the actual battle yeah. of Bishiba occurs. Yeah, and, and, and so you, it's it's been raging for most of the day before this charge happens, and that's taking place. And it, th that's why it's so significant, because they seize the opportunity of something that might have led to a return to the stagnation, which is what you've seen up to that point. So after um, Murray's two failed battles at Gaza, you see the stagnation of the line, there's no progress. Um, and those two Australian units, depending on what you read, there is a degree of initiative anyway, and they, they seize the opportunity and they, they manage to um, to secure Beersheba or to outflank the enemy at Beersheba, who, who are then withdrawing. and, and Effectively, what it means it's it's like the key that unlocks that bit of the defensive line. So you've then outflanked Gaza, which means you see a general withdrawal, and that's that's basically what's happening. Um, and it's a pursuit from there. There are lots of battles in between, and a very complicated theatre of war. Um, but uh, British and Commonwealth forces are pursuing the the Ottoman Turks up to the point at which um, they secure Jerusalem in the middle of December and that's this is the very famous thing because yeah. Lloyd George has said you know the Prime Minister at the time yeah in, in Britain deliver Lloyd us George. um a Christmas present you know for the nation this is Allenby this is his, his Christmas present for the nation he secures Jerusalem is seen as this like major or it's supposed it, it, to have it, been it, this major it, it, it sounds I mean it's very symbolic I suppose yeah it's absolutely yeah yeah and as, as we sort of said got to remember you know if you are a member of the British public and you're trying to form an understanding of, of what's taking place globally, your focus is always going to be on the Western Front, as ours still is. Um, and so uh, that isn't delivering exciting, well, I mean, yeah, uh, or, or groundbreaking uh, breakthroughs and developments, whereas this is seen as sort of saying, okay, well, not there, but over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, Is it almost used to distract us? And you mentioned before about lots of battles happening in mm, 1917 mm. and not many going well yeah is it used almost as a propaganda tool as in we actually have a victory let's talk about it and we get to jerusalem for christmas 1917 yeah. it's, I, it's a big deal yeah I, if, I, if you know if social media had existed at the time <laughs> you know, so it's a big, it would have been <laughs> fun it's fun into something i mean I, I think it's good news in in a in a year of largely not good news yeah so uh, and i think it would uh, undoubtedly have been used to sort of to to maybe um, focus people's attentions on something that was was going better, um, but um, yeah, it's 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 very significant, but often ignored, still. And we commemorate, of course, like all the casualties. Uh, we commemorate casualties of the Battle of Bishiba That's in right. a cemetery. Yeah, Bishiba War Cemetery. Yeah, um, it's initially it's quite small. 
Uh, and I think it may be the original burials there from the time might number only about 130. But, but what people might not realise about most of our cemeteries um, is they are subject to something called concentration. So um, when people die, particularly in, in a battle like that, um, they may be buried close to where they fall, or where they die. So they won't be brought into cemeteries, made up cemeteries. Cemeteries of any sort of formal structure are often connected to um, aid posts, hospitals, casualty clearing stations, things like this. Not all of them, but in most situations, that's what you see. Um, and so you have isolated burials all throughout the landscape where people may have died. Um, and that's what you see at Beersheba now. So they, those, I don't know the, the numbers I should do off the top of my head, but I don't, um, are brought into the cemetery uh, as, as it now stands. And if you go on the website, you want to flick through, um, go to the, the, the cemetery description, you can actually click on the casualties. It'll give you the full list. Of course. Um, if you go and look at the documents connected to those individuals, uh, you'll see that some of them will have concentration data and allow you to sort of work out where they were before they came into Beersheba. Thank you, George. I think that was absolutely fascinating. I certainly learned something today. I hope our audience did. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us. Remember to like and subscribe on YouTube. <laughs>